Today's giveaway is Maps Anabolic. Woo! Woo! One of the best Maps programs ever developed. The most popular one for sure. Great overall muscle and strength builder. And one of you guys, or girls, or whatever you claim yourself to be, whatever, uh, we honor it all, is going to get this program for free. Here's how you can get free access to Maps Anabolic. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. It helps us with the YouTube algorithm, all right? Full disclosure. Make it a good comment. Also, subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. If you do all those things and if we like your comment, we'll notify you and you get free access to Maps Anabolic. Also, one more thing before we get to this incredible show. This is one of the best shows we've ever done. 100%. You'll love it. But before we get there, got to tell you about the sales that we got going on. Maps Anywhere, the equipment-free workout program is 50% off. And the Fit Mom Bundle, which includes Maps Anabolic, Maps Anywhere, Maps Hit, and the Intuitive Nutrition Guide, already discounted because it's a bundle, is also an additional 50% off, okay? So those things, half off. If you're interested, head over to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code NOVEMBER50. So that's NOVEMBER50 without a space for that discount. All right, here comes the awesome show. All right, today's fit tip, don't do fasting for weight loss. It's a terrible fat loss approach. All right, guys, so let's- I like that Let's one. talk about this a little bit because fasting- I'm insulted. I'm leaving this conversation. Fasting has now been like this big thing, right, in the fitness and health space, and most people use it as a strategy to lose weight. I actually really- I just got a DM uh, a couple of weeks ago. I'm glad you brought this up for a fitness tip because- if you if you listen to just one or two episodes where we've talked about fasting, you um, might get a misunderstanding on our our stance or our point of view on it, right? So we've done episodes dedicated just to fasting where we talk all about the benefits of it. I think we've done specific episodes of why you shouldn't fast. And so depending on which episode you, <laughs> and I saw people actually arguing with each other on, yeah. on Instagram mm -hmm. over like what our philosophy is around fasting and if we're pro or against it. And there's this misconception that we're like anti-fasting. And it's like, no, it's just, we're anti-fasting for the uh, for trying to lose body fat. Yes, it's not yes. a good strategy for that. Yeah. So the big thing that people completely ignore, and the fitness industry does a terrible, uh, actually a great job of ignoring this, are the psychological effects of particular diets, and they don't look at the long-term potential effects. Right. If you look at the long-term effects of fasting as a weight loss strategy, it has about the same fail rate as any diet, right? Any diet, um, any popular diet is t causes weight loss through a reduction in calories. Same thing with fasting, right? You fast, you skip meals, you don't eat as many calories, you lose weight. The problem is when you go into it with the idea of wanting to lose weight, you're already going into a this approach with this kind of bad relationship with food. Mm -hmm. It's not a long-term approach because at some point you stop fasting because you're like, okay, I'm done skipping meals or whatever. And then you end up going in the opposite direction. You end up gaining the ba the weight back and then some. And back in the day, by the way, I want to say this. I you know I've been training people and working with people in fitness professionally now for over over two decades. Before they called it fasting, they used to call it skipping meals, right? Yeah. Skipping breakfast, skipping. And this is what people did all the time. Obese people would do this all the time to try and lose weight, and then they'd gain it back. Well, we have to kind of set boundaries and, and limiters out there because there are like real conditions like anorexia, bulimia, and yes. like uh, conditions out there. You do not want to tell them to, to get into fasting. That would be like the worst combination ever. And so to differentiate that and there is value to it, but it's a totally different mindset than going into it, just trying to, you know, improve your body composition, for instance. Now, do you guys think it's no better, no worse than any other diet? Yeah, I think it's, it depends on the diet that we're comparing it to, but I think it's very similar. It's that kind of restrict mentality with the wrong root, um, I guess, motivation. Well, it's all diets. Okay, yes. the, the thing that all diets have in common is what? They it, restrict they calories. Reduce calories. Right. What, one way or another, whether you're actually counting the calories themselves or you eliminate a carbohydrate, you eliminate a, a fat, you reduce protein, no matter what the diet is. The, the real formula behind all of them and why they work so well for the people that they work well for. In the short term. Yeah, in the short term is that they reduce calories. So my question to you is that since that is the basic formula for all diets, is is it any better or worse than any of them? Yeah, I don't think it's any necessarily any better or worse. I think, now fasting's been around for thousands of years. It's part of uh, almost all uh, religious practices, especially the, the the main, the, the biggest religious practices. 
But really, it was about changing your relationship to food through detachment, right? Mm -hmm. Detaching from worldly things. And this is a great practice. This is where I think fasting is at low value. Because if you go into it with this detachment attitude, like I'm going to detach myself from food for a second so that I can deal with my feelings and my emotions and look at my relationship to food, then it can be very valuable. Now, it doesn't work very well if your issue with food is that you're anorexic or bulimic because it just pushes you more in that direction. And if you're just the regular person trying to lose weight, you're not really learning any good strategies aside from just abstinence. Mm -hmm. And this tends to result in a binge reversal when you're done with it, which is why it's a terrible strategy. So yes, you lose weight in the beginning, but then when you go off, you go just like all of the diets, you go in the opposite direction. Yeah, I like it for the fact that you can observe your behaviors more uh, when you remove yourself from your habits, right? And, and so like abstinence, I think it's a very important practice for disciplines in order to be able to really have a good look and assess, uh, you know, what those behaviors look like. And that way I can tweak and alter those when I, you know, uh, decide to implement them again. Now, what about the the adaptation process of it? Like it's, a lot of people love this, right? And I think why they like it, it's easy, right? There's not a lot of rules to fasting. The most successful <laughs> diets are the ones, yeah, and I don't mean success in terms of long-term, the ones that people buy into. Right. Always have like, like one or two simple rules. And I think that's why you get people that like it so much. Yes. A lot of people are like, are, we're almost already eating in a, in a, the smaller window. They're like, oh, well, I already skipped breakfast anyways. Now I just kind of stretch it out till yeah. about two o'clock. Like that's not hard. Mm -hmm. And so I think people like doing it because it's easier. Now, what about some of the pitfalls as far as your metabolism with with doing a strategy like this? Do you think that the average person that follows a, a diet fasting uh, versus a different diet that maybe you just pull out carbohydrates or something, do you think they're, uh, you're more likely to reduce more calories than needed in fasting because you're, you're just like, I'm, not, I'm completely abstaining? That's a really good question. I think it depends too on the context, right? Uh, if you're in a calorie deficit, you're always kind of pushing your body to slow down its metabolism. Your body's always trying to adapt, right? But if you combine that with good strength training and resistance training and proteins high, you can offset that a little bit. But you make a very good point, right? Cutting out food entirely might result in a larger calorie restriction than somebody who, let's say, says, I'm going to only eat whole natural foods or I'm going to cut carbs out, but I'm not going to skip you know, a bunch of meals. Right. So I, I could definitely see that happening. And I've seen people you know, fasting does over time can cause a bit of a stress. So can just calorie re uh, restriction, but fasting in particular. And they've actually done shown some studies that fasting in comparison to regular feeding windows with calorie restriction, so all of the things being controlled, fasting results in more muscle loss in, in some cases, or not as much muscle gain. Wasn't that a recent study? Yes, it was. Yeah, that just came out because we had talked about it before and uh, I thought it would actually be more muscle sparing than what it was, but it actually uh, just, I think it was Lane who did. Was it Lane who shared that study? He did, mm -hmm. he did share it. Now, I, I, th I do think that, again, we're kind of like, now we're focusing on the which diet's best for fat loss. Or the diet that helps you develop the best relationship to food and the best practices and behaviors, not from a point of self-hate or restriction, but rather like wanting to live this kind of healthy uh, lifestyle, that's going to be the best approach yeah. long-term. So I don't care about the short term. I mean, how many times have we seen clients do great in the short term and then right. do terrible in the long term? All well, it's the all about the intent. It's the it's that like sort of mindset that's going into it that matters. And that's really what we're addressing. It's not necessarily that there are a lot of benefits to fasting. You just have to have the right mindset going into it. Now, do you guys think there is ideal ways for clients or yourself to use fasting? Like, so we obviously use it. Um, I use fasting occasionally, intermittently. Um, and I have taught clients to do it. Are there specific like ways that you would tell them if you were encouraging them to try something like fasting? So there are certain types of clients I think that works really well with to help them with their food relationship, right? Uh, the, the person who's obsessed with needing to pack on size, the person that's afraid, mm. this was me, right? I used to just eat, eat, eat. And then I was afraid to skip a meal. Oh my God, if I skip the meal, I'm not going to yeah. gain any muscle or, oh my God. what's So for me, fasting was good in that sense because it helped me change my relationship to food. Oh, I could skip a couple meals and it wasn't devastating to my physique. So that's when I would use it. When I'd get the guy who hired me, who's just eating way too much and is afraid 
to cut anything. And in those cases, I'd be like, let's try fasting for a couple of days. Let me show you that. Yeah, it's, it's usually okay. people that are eating uh, continuously throughout the day. So I have, I've had clients that like snack a lot too in between meals and they just feel like they're paranoid that they're not going to have food like accessible and available yeah. to them. And so, you know, to just, even just skipping a meal for them a lot of times is like mind blowing mm -hmm. that they're going to be okay. And this hunger sensation is actual hunger and it's not craving. So to differentiate between those two signals, I think is really an important thing to, to figure out. Totally. Now, speaking of food, have you guys seen the news on the Beyond Meat company and all these companies that were, remember they were creating, it was like a big deal about it. We talked about it on yeah, our podcast. Franken meats. Maybe a year or two ago with all these plant-based meats that, you know, taste like a burger or whatever. And sales were skyrocketing and all these fast food joints were yeah, starting yeah. to adopt it. And we were very skeptical and we're like, I don't think this is going to work. Their sales are tanking. No way. Tanking. Why? Well, I mean, what we predicted, the fad and the novelty of it wore off. I mean, yeah. you're going to eat a product. But tanking? tanking? I mean, I would have thought it would have been like a slow. It's no, like, like 14, 15% drop. And wow. their stock is just plummeting because the novelty is up. Like, mm. you, first of all, you're creating a product. Really though? that I mean, a 14, 15% drop is normally like bad news came out. That's normally like somebody died from a yeah, impossible that, burger. No, that's this interesting because it was in like all these fast food chains were starting to at least yes. offer that as as an option. Most and, of them have like, it now. Wow. Normally, when you see like a like a falling out of favor, right, you'll see like a slow, gradual decline, right? No, look but at that. Fall off the cliff is normally. Yeah, I'll read the title here. It says Beyond Meat had a disastrous third quarter with sales declining by fourteen percent. And net losses mounting to fifty one point eight million compared with the loss of nineteen million what? the previous year. Okay, here this and, and I, if I'm not mistaken, we talked about this on a on a previous podcast. You're creating a product that's trying to copy as close as it possibly can another product. Mm -hmm. So it's trying to be identical. What are the benefits of it? Well, first off, there are none. It's got a million yeah. ingredients to one. So it's ground beef versus this engineered food. Number two, the macros were identical. So it wasn't like you were getting less calories, less grams of fat or whatever. It was identical calories. Well, they marketed it as a healthier option, which wasn't true. Not true. And so really the only benefit, I guess, if you know, in your 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 true climate vegan, change thing. You know, well, is is the cruelty part, right? That's it. That that was the only thing that was the Oh, I felt like they factor. tried to go the, the climate change angle more than anything. They else. were trying to do all that, but but it doesn't people burger eaters don't really care. I mean, the novelty wore off. Everybody tried it. And then everybody went back to- Wow, burgers. I didn't know that. That's yeah. all recent right now? That's all. Ha that's happening Yeah, right now. It's kind of tanking. You know, so. we talked about that and we did speculate that. I wish, I wish we, I don't know how to short a stock. I've never shorted a stock before. Yeah. That would have been a good one to short. I've never shorted a stock myself. You have That would have been a great, I mean, that, shit, we, we could have. Wow, Doug just pulled it 19%. Yeah, weak outlook. But I mean, think about it. Like, first off, you're a fast food eater. That's where a lot of their sales went, right? Yeah. They don't really care, I think. They like the taste. I don't know about you guys, but <laughs> yeah, I've never gone to, for health. Yeah, I've never gone to a burger place like, oh, I'm going to get the health. Like, I'm going to, this is for my health. Like, I want something. Now, none of good. you guys have even tried it, right? I don't think you have, have you? I haven't. I actually was curious to try it, but I, no, I'm, I Doug, have you? I actually tried something. I was at a friend's house and they like, pulled out, <laughs> no, they, they pulled out these burgers and they were the Beyond Meat or Impossible Burger, that type of thing. And to me, it didn't taste anything like beef, personally. Oh really? Yeah, but I don't know which one they had bought, but uh, I was not oil. I was not impressed, and I wasn't very happy with them to be honest. Oh, they, it, they, I mean, they do a good job of making it look like it. Like the, that picture looks like a burger. It's the yeah. closest that they've ever got before, right? The the it's the close, and one of the the secrets was the bloodiness, right? The, the they like squeeze it, and some beet juice yeah. comes out, looks like blood. Right? Yeah. Did they really? Did yeah, they went that they, far to. It, wow. I mean, that's why that was why everybody was excited because like, oh my God, this is as close as they've ever got. But I'm like, okay, if the, if maybe if the calories were lower and it tastes similar, but the macros were identical, it was nothing better about it. And then consumers aren't as stupid as people think you're looking at like, okay, here's a beef burger. It's beef. Here's the ingredient. Have you look at the ingredient list on this? Yeah, it's lot. like, <laughs> it's like super engineered food. Yeah. And most people know that that's probably not better for you. So again, unless you're just a vegan, but that market's already kind of tapped. I don't think that's a huge market. I don't think it's growing. Speaking it's of food, what'd you guys think of the food at the party? Oh, hey, happy birthday! Oh, that, that was, was a great party. Good. Huh? good food, right? Unbelievable food. Yeah, I was. I was my uh, my sister in law and brother in law. They uh, so we were we were hiring a chef and we were doing this whole like champagne theme, right? So 
Katrina looked up like all the foods that pair well with champagne. And then she started looking for chefs to do it. And we got some like crazy quote or whatever. And her sister found out that she was doing this. And she's like, no, let me, let me do it for Adam's birthday. Like he loves our cooking anyways. And she's like, I'll totally, I'll go all out. I promise. And Katrina was like, well, I kind of, I really want to make this kind of over the top and special for him. And she's like, no, no, let us do it. So I was, <clears> I, so I didn't know any of what was coming. And then they show, they show up. And I mean, they got, they had the full yeah. suit. Outfit. I was going to ask you about that because I've met them before. I didn't know they had any culinary, you know, like they did it. They, they don't. Like, they, I mean, they cooked their ass off, right? Dude, they played the part. It was amazing. I know. I thought yeah. that was so the presentation too. Yeah. I thought that was so nice of them to do that. They like totally went all out on it. it was, you know what I really amazing. liked? I mean, all of it was really good, but they had now it looked like prosciutto, but it wasn't prosciutto. It was a Spanish like dried meat. I don't know what it was called. The Serrano ham, I believe. Is that what it is? Yeah. It was really good. Oh, I thought I thought that was bruschetta. That wasn't bruschetta. What is it? No, prosciutto. Oh, prosciutto, prosciutto or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Prosciutto. It was it was a big old ham leg. Yeah, and you could carve it off yourself. It's not she as salty. That, she said she got that at Costco. Get out. Yeah, I actually didn't even have. I didn't have none of that. That's there was oh, yeah, so was much good. food. A lot of stuff. I didn't get the ribeye. The, the ribs were the best. Though. The ribs that were was my favorite. Yeah. Crazy. The yeah. sauce that he did it in was was so good. Man, yeah, it's totally oh, different. Incredible. Yeah. So did good. you have a good time? I said you had. Okay, here's the. I know you. I know having tons of people. Especially at your house, yeah. and you're not <laughs> you. You're a bit of a dichotomy. You're often the center of attention, but don't necessarily like to be the center of attention with something like that. Like you don't want everybody looking at you and talking. Yeah, about yeah. Them. And this was your party. At one point, it was a big video, yeah. you know, all about you. Like, how did you feel? Yeah, you know that's a, uh, that. You know, it's a funny question, right? Because you're right. There's there's a part of me that uh, doesn't mind being the center of attention for certain things, but for other things, I don't. If that that's weird, yeah. you're right. So. Uh, I don't do good with gift free, but Katrina did. She knows me so well, so like I none of I didn't open any presents in front of anybody, so she didn't make a big spend. She did want to show me the video that Eli did, which was so cool. That was such a cool video uh, yeah. that he had made. It was just all the blooper, like right? all the bloopers from Mind Pump, and so that was a really nice surprise. That was fun, but uh, yeah, she did a really good job. She knows me, so she knows to not put me on the on the spot in the spotlight like that too much, and just kind of let me do my thing and hang back. Plus, I was probably pretty drunk by that time, so I wasn't really thinking too much about it. I mean, we had <laughs> yeah. we went out the night before, so Friday night she had set up a uh, you know five star Michelin dinner over in Carmel. That was an amazing experience, and uh, uh, the four of us polished three bottles of wine off. And then the next day we jump out of a plane in the morning. Oh yeah, skydiving. We, yeah, yeah, and then we have a, a yeah, birthday party later on. So are you? So she invited all of us for you and your birthday to skydive, and I was like, no. I'm not going to go, but I know Justin went. So was yeah. it, is it, do you want to do it again? Is it fun? Like, what's the deal? Uh, yeah, it was fun. I don't know if I'd do it again. I mean, I, it was kind <laughs> of like one of those things that you thought about, maybe I'll do this some point in my life, but I had no urgency, uh, to do it, but like, uh, just, just stepping up and getting into it, it was, it was a blast. It was, it was way more. Uh, easy than jumping in a, a F-16. That was Did you, sure. now, was it what you expected? Because it wasn't anything I expected. It wasn't like what I anticipated. What was it like you? No, it wasn't. So, it wasn't okay, so explain like that. What do you mean about what you thought? Well, I thought, I, so I thought that, um, I thought I'd be more nervous and scared. I really did. I thought yeah. like, because well, there's a long, like we were there for almost three, like three hours, hours yeah. before we even got to get out of the plane. So, I mean, I thought just that anticipation of like, I got to do this was going to like make me all nervous, but it, I wasn't. I mean, I was with like seven of my family and friends. And so we were just laughing, having a good time. And I kept waiting for like, oh, pretty soon here, I'm going to get really nervous because it's going to get closer and closer that time. Yeah. I never really felt that. And the, I had a little bit of it right before literally jumping out because they put you on this. I, I swear to God, the plane's no wider than this and no taller than that yeah you just and then, crouch and they the have these two with everybody it looks like a um you know not a two by but a big piece of wood almost like as a, for a seat that's literally yeah. this wide it's just a long bench yeah a long bench and you straddle it like this and you're literally you know nuts to butt all the yeah. way to yeah. the from the front to the back of the plane that tight like you're i'm touching the shoulder of the person next to me i'm touching the yeah. wall here i was in some little french dude's He's, lap yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. no <laughs> literally it's, it, that's only the third time like, don't worry it's yeah. going to <laughs> be okay <laughs> So like, I feel so weird right now. <laughs> the the part that was probably the most nerve wracking was when you know, and he he's he every once in a while he reaches his watch over in front of me so I could see the elevation. And I know we're going Is up. He's kind of hugging you at the same time. Oh no, he's, 
he bro, we, actually lifted me yeah. and sat my butt in his crotch so he could strap me as tight wow. as we could. And so you let him do it because you wanted to be snug. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not know, trying to be like, loose hey, up there. Good so, time. Yeah. I'm totally like, missed out, Doug. So he's, doing this. he's telling me, right? And you're watching 14, 15,000, and we're going to 18,000, right? So this is the highest tandem jump in the world. So there's none higher than this in the entire world. And so you're watching him get, you know, 16, 17, we get to 18,000. As soon as 18,000 hits, the front just goes, whoosh, he lifts it up and people just, and I got about 10 people in front of me before I go. And you, yeah. you're strapped in with a scooter. So you're like scooting uh -huh. on the thing all the way down. And people, foom, 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 was there anybody foom. left there kind of ushering you out? Cause there's nobody left ushering me out. No, I was the last on yeah, my side. Me too. And then there was two other people after me, but on the other side and it just went so fast. But the time of, you know, they open it and people start going out that I got, that was the most anxiety that I had. Like, here like, it is. Yeah. Oh yeah. Here it is. Here it is. And then, I, and then you just don't have much time to think once you get up there, your feet ready, he dumps you out. You go, right? he grabbed my head, tilted back, pushed me out. We went. And then I thought if you guys ever been, do you, are you even do roller coasters or no? Yeah. yeah. yeah I okay. So at, at, um, great America, you have the edge or drop, drop zone. zone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So when you do that ride, I mean, I've done the thing a hundred times and every time it gets you that, <gasps> yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So we have a 90 second free fall. I thought I was going to be <gasps> for, 90 seconds. for 90 seconds. That's what I was kind of anticipating. It did not feel like that at all. Hmm. The minute he jumped out of the plane, all the anxiety went away. And now it was just, you're, you know, dropping till you reach terminal velocity and you're, it's the, the wind is flying up in your face so much. You're just trying to breathe. And yeah. so I'm like, breathing through my like nose. It's like a dude with a hose was just blasting you with air. Yeah, you almost feel like you're holding your it breath. Was, it was too much. And yeah. Does it give you anxiety? It, no, it, that that part wasn't. It was just, at that point, I'm just trying to breathe normal and you almost, you feel like you're floating. Dude, you, you can't breathe though. You don't feel like you're falling. Yeah. You don't feel like you're falling. And the only part that was scary, so the scariest part for me was actually, I would have never thought this at all. So he's got me all harnessed in. We dropped for 90 seconds. Parachute pulls, and that's a jerk and a half because you're doing uh, 130 miles an hour. Oh, and it slows you to 15 miles an hour instantly, right? So that's like, Ugh! yanks you back. And then after we're falling for a few seconds, he's like, all right, all right, you all good? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm good, I'm good. And he's like, okay, I'm going to loosen you up a little bit so you get more comfortable. And so he starts loosening the straps around my thighs, <laughs> around my chest, which is what's yeah. holding me it's to to this guy. Totally disconcerting. And so the, the initial le release, he, I drop. And I'm, I mean, I'm looking straight down and you can't see him behind you. And then he's loosening the straps that are holding you to him. So that part, like that was the most, I'm like, oh, we're good, dude. Yeah, we're cool. I'm <laughs> yeah. cool. I don't, I'm not, I'm not uncomfortable at all. So that part was a little nerve wracking for me. Now, and, did you guys get hit the ground hard? Like how yeah, did you hit the ground? Dude, so I had to land on my butt and. <laughs> oh, well, you're fine. Yeah, dude. <laughs> but I bounced. Like it was like, bang, dunk, dunk, dunk. Oh, wow. And then I land on some sticker bush. Anyway. But yeah, like the first part though, for me, like I could have done without, I'll be honest with you. Like it, I only because so we're crouching, we're kind of going towards the edge uh, near where the wing was. And, you know, I'm, I'm like kind of looking out and I was kind of like tripping as I was like, because the wind started to get me and I started to kind of fall over and I caught myself right before we jumped. And, and so I was like in that state of, you know, when you're about to fall, you're like, oh, oh shit. And then I never really got regained my balance. So we just kept going. It felt like I kept falling that whole time, you know? So my body was just like, ah, and I just, I don't know. I was having like a panic attack and then like I couldn't <laughs> breathe. And then, but then once we got the chute open, it was like, Dude, it was serene. It was like you could see like everything up there. And then he let us steer it, you know, which yeah. was really cool. That was my favorite part. Yeah, that now, was the best part. Now, of course, I know, I know it's really rare for someone actually ex extremely safe in the U.S. to to skydive. The the death rates are su super, super low. I, nonetheless, I was still worried, right? I got two of my business partners it's... jumping out of a plane. I'm like texting you guys. Let me know when you land. <laughs> Nobody's responding. I'm like, oh, you know, but <laughs> yeah, but it's 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 very, very safe. Uh, but still for me. No, not yeah. going to jump out of a plane. I have no desire to jump out of a perfectly good yeah, airplane. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's no, no I, notch off. For uh, me. Yeah, no I get thanks. it. Yeah, it was. It's. It's not. I probably. I would. Okay, if I. The only way I would do it again is if you know when Max is eighteen and he goes, Dad, I really want to jump out of a plane. Like I'd rally for now, him. Now, could you imagine though yeah. the very rare events that people like something doesn't work? They get a long time to think about that they're going to die, right? Because you you fall <laughs> out and then you're like, oh no. Okay. Time. Well, I well, actually, we go. I would, part of what probably makes it really safe too is that, well, first of all, I think they have two parachutes. So they yeah, have, they a, back, they have a, backup a backup parachute. Yeah. And then I would hope these, so they're all like ex, you know, rangers and seal guys. And like, 
8,000 plus jumps. So I would hope if ours didn't, there'd be some sort of a hand signal you give to another guy and they probably fly over to you. No, you can watch too much Mission Impossible. Well, right? you don't think that, I feel like, <laughs> I mean, the camp, the, I mean, so um, you have an option Dude, to. the camera guy was jacked. Yeah, you have, you have an I, option sure to get like a get second cameraman. So you have multiple angles. And so I had that. So I had the guys attached to me and then I had another dedicated guy that's just filming me. And he had full control. I mean, he fly below us, above us, because he had kind of like a wingsuit on oh, him. Oh, wow. So he, and he came over, grabbed my arm for a second, let go of it, swung around, shot me from this side. So I, I, I imagine Take if our out. shoot yeah. didn't open up, yeah. he could, you know, come in and bear Tap hug me. Head, and, go on the other side. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who was that? <laughs> Who did that? Yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah, it's Todd. Wow, he looked like crazy. a Todd. Dude. He was definitely yeah. Todd. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. He, you, he had Todd energy. You said that the, the camera guy was real jacked. Or yeah, it was Jack. When we were waiting around, it was kind of funny because he was in a tank top. And he had big old arms, you know, and he has this like flat top and he's just like, hi, I'm your camera yeah. guy. You know, and I'm like, like I, worked I out thought too. for sure out of irony that guy was going to be on my back. I was so disappointed in Justin. He couldn't give me a point break quote, dude. I'm like, dude, you uh, know all of these. He froze on me because I wanted to do a like I a I don't know, like, yeah, like Johnny Utah. Like I don't, I don't remember any like exact. I've quote only from seen the movie. that movie once. What? Really? Uh, yeah, only one time. Get really, here, yeah, dude? I've only seen it once. Oh, that's a that's a must watch. Again. I know, I know. Oh, yeah. Anyway, yeah, hey, dude, I gotta tell you guys. One. I this is so crazy to me. So I over, this weekend I dived deep into supplement land and hormone land. And I was reading about, so I've talked about this before, but in the early 2000s- This is such a typical weekend of us. You and I jumped out of a plane and Sal was <laughs> reading studies. Land. reading like crazy. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to give a little little bit of uh, history here. So in the late 90s, mid to late 90s, pro-hormones hit the market. Androstenedione, DHEA. So yeah. these are hormones that have to get converted by the body to other active hormones, right? So androstenedione can be turned into testosterone. I think it can be turned into estrogen or whatever. It was a big deal. They turned out to be nothing. Like if you're, if you got normal testosterone, whatever, you take andro, it's not going to give you any benefit. But nonetheless, it was a big deal because it was a hormone, right? That you could buy over the counter. Well, anyway, the supplement market, they get really smart. And so they start to create quote unquote other pro hormones that have like actual action in the body. Yeah. Now I was a in the in the this you're talking now the early 2000s. I'm still a young kid. I'm in my 20s basically. And I'm reading these articles, these supplement articles and I'm like, "Oh, pro hormone, it's safe or whatever." Well, it turns out they weren't, right? So these were what these supplement companies did is they went through old pharmaceutical company rejects. So yeah. pharmaceutical companies in the 1950s, 60s and 70s were coming up with testosterone uh alternatives quote unquote, anabolic steroids. And many of them didn't make it to market. What these supplement companies did is they looked at these old chemicals and said, oh, cool. They're gray market. There's no laws against them. We can sell them as per hormones, but they're actually active. Okay. Yeah. So where am I Don't going mind with this? the side effects. So check this out, right? So two of my favorite quote unquote pro hormones in my early twenties that I used many, many times, one was called super draw and another one was called methyl one testosterone. Okay. And the reason why they were my favorites is because when I took them, I'd gain like 15 pounds. I'd get jacked and get hella strong. Is the methyl one, isn't that the one that had like the little the little molecule like symbol, oh, that's symbol the brand. in the front of it? Yeah. That's Molecular what, nutrition might have been one of them. Yeah, right? Yes. So, and you'd gain like all this, like real fast, like four or five weeks, just and get real big and strong. Like, oh, this is so cool. I'm taking a, a pro hormone. Anyway, I'm reading articles and shit. Now they're illegal. They had, they passed laws to make these illegal. Well, it turns out they were actual steroids. And when you, nowadays, uh, bodybuilders and powerlifters, there's on all these. I went on all these forums, and there, there's all these debates as to whether or not Superdrol, methyl one testosterone, is more effective than Anadrol, Dianabol, classic steroids. And apparently, these guys are saying, "Oh yeah, Superdrol is the strongest oral you could take." That shit was over the counter. I, I was taking that back in the day, and I, I thought it was totally safe. I don't know if I've shared this on the podcast. That's I crazy. think I've told you guys before. Um, there was a there was a product that was same same thing, but it was Trend, and it was called like Trimbalone or something like that, or Super Trend. I don't yeah. even remember what the name of it was. Um, but I had the same experience. It was the most amazing over the counter drug that I had ever taken uh, for gaining muscle. It's also the the first time that I um, ever experienced gyno. So it actually, and I had before I had taken steroids. So this is, I, I'd taken steroids in my early twenties. This is like mid, I'd say 25 to 27 range. Uh, when I took this 
And I had I had worse side effects from that over the counter uh, pro hormone than I did from taking real steroids. Crazy, that's well, how no, strong it was. It's crazy because I was watching these videos on YouTube with these competitive powerlifters and bodybuilders, and literally the conversation was Superdrol versus Anadrol. Anadrol is an old school steroid. Bodybuilders have taken for a long time, known to be real harsh and strong. These guys were like, "Oh, Superdrol is way stronger." I'm like, "Holy cow, dude! We were mm. taking that." We were buying that at the local supplement store. Oh, yeah. Taking so like it, nothing. Isn't like SARM sort of the new version of that? Except uh, the, I mean, I, I don't know about the side effects and all that, but I'm sure that it's just not as tested. So, SARMs are not steroids, but they're chemicals that attach to the androgen receptor and cause similar kind of actions. But you, you're right. At least these anabolics have decades of research and have been used. SARMs are kind of like, we don't know really what the long-term necessary effects are of them. Yeah. And, and you know why people buy them? Because they're gray market. You can yeah, buy you them can, online. You can get them online. Believe me, if Superdrol and Methyl 1 testosterone was still available online, I'm pretty sure nobody would buy SARMs. <laughs> they would still be sticking to this other, you know, crazy strong stuff or whatever. Yeah, and yeah. Speaking of YouTube, did you see YouTube's taking off the dislike, the thumbs down now? Off oh, features? no, I heard they're going, they're not taking what it off. What was the motivation behind they're that? Not, they're not taking it off. They're going and they're they're pulling people who that's all they do. Oh, I thought they were taking oh, it off completely. Taking, oh, yeah. No, I, sure? mean, I, read the same, I read the people. same article. Maybe I misinterpreted it. The way I, the way I interpreted it was there, because there's a lot of kind of bot accounts and accounts that are going around. Like we have, we have the same five or four thumbs yeah. down that we, on every video. And it's like, Almost instantly. They're all your ex girlfriends. Yeah, yeah, no, it's either I'm, that it's or it's Justin. Bot or it's me. Ju yeah, yeah, it's it. Justin. It's not me. I promise you. Like they, uh, we get four every person. time we post a video, no matter how amazing the video is, it gets four thumbs down, and I think it's it right away. Is oh no, here's what it is. So this is on the Verge, and the title is "YouTube gives dislikes the thumbs down, so it hides public accounts, so creators will still be able to see how many people dislike their videos, but it's not going to be private. I'm excuse me, it's not going to be public." Oh, interesting. Really? So the public won't see how many dislikes. So uh, didn't they try the same thing with Instagram and it, it never took off? Remember they had all the, they they were hiding uh, likes. So the again, the creator, the person who had the page, I could see how many likes I'm getting, but Justin couldn't come onto my page and see mm -hmm. how many likes right. the photo got. Right. They, so they, we'll they be piloted that, but it never seemed to get any legs. Well, so do you, do you hear the conspiracy theory around it? Oh, let's hear so it. there's a conspiracy theory, right? So it? so first off, this okay, they're going to hide the- Thought you getting too many dislikes. That's what? right. No. That, yeah, because Shh, what? Because this is the conspiracy theory. Biden will give a speech or Fauci will talk about something and it'll get like a hundred thousand dislikes, dislikes yeah. and like, you know, 2000 likes or whatever. And so that's the conspiracy theory is that now is, is this for sure happening? Are they going to uh, pilot really it just like they did with the Instagram thing? And do, do creators have some say in it? Like, it, okay. It says here that it looks like they're going to, they're going to do it. That's really stupid to me because. As uh, as as a, a consumer of YouTube, I like guess as a, as a as a creator, okay, whatever. But as a consumer, like when I'm looking for a topic that I want totally. to, to learn about, and I see five videos recommended to me, the one that got most the, the the ratio of thumbs up to thumbs down is normally what dictates whether I watch it yep. or not. Mm -hmm. Because I I want something that is mostly thumbs up or get a majority of thumbs up. I'm not gonna go watch a video that's 50 50 where it's like oh that's a crapshoot. This is gonna be right. Yeah. Did they do that to change the algorithm so they could you know sort of promote what they want to promote easier so that Does we that don't make see sense? That yeah. Maybe I mean because think about it. If they really wanted to like stop the trolling, yeah, they'd get rid of comments, not the thumbs down. Nobody gives a shit about the thumbs down. I mean, well, I, they want that engagement though, right? Yeah, but the comments is where you see all the crazy trolls and stuff like that. Thumbs sure. up, thumbs down, whatever. And I agree with you, Adam. I think it's a great way for consumers to see well, what videos are good or bad. Or I, I think know. there's something to that though. If you're just like such a negative uh, contributor, like you've just done all thumbs down, you're negative for so like every that's video. What, I feel like there that is like something. So to that's what discuss. I thought they were going to try and police a little bit. Which I'm like, whatever, you know, because yeah. I found a feature on YouTube before that I didn't know existed. Um, so one of the things I, I, I and we've talked about off air about this um, because we razz each other so much and talk shit. Sometimes we have like fans that are like, they want to talk the same way. And obviously online, it's not always received that way. Yeah. You don't know, like, is, is this person just being playful? Right, or are they yeah. being a, or, or being a dick? And there's been times where I, I fire back at somebody kind of like talking shit, probably a little harder than I would if I knew you were a fan yeah. and a consumer some, some, of our content, yeah. right? I think they're just trolling me. And so I'm like, oh, fuck you. I'm going to put this person in their place. <laughs> and then I do. And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Sorry, bro. I love the show. And I'm like, kidding. oh, so now on YouTube, there's a feature that if uh, someone, whoever's commenting, you can click on their name 
and it'll show you everything they've ever commented on your channel. Mm -hmm. So now I can go back and then, so this is now how I decide if I'm going to roast some oh, troll or not. Oh, they all these good things. Yeah, like if, yeah, if they're just teasing one thing, right? If he's just making fun of my calves or saying, making a comment on something I'm wearing this one time. And then I look back and he's commented seven yeah. other times and the other time is, oh, you guys' programs are amazing. Oh, I love you guys. And then it's like that one, oh, okay, I'm just going to, whatever. But if it's someone who's like, I look back and I see, Oh, this motherfucker, every time he posts on this thing, he is talking mad shit about one of us or something. So See, they don't now, get after Now, him. the conspiracy the theory for me is interesting because here's here's one of the reasons why I think it's interesting. Like Rotten Tomatoes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Recently, uh, Rotten Tomatoes has been this upside down flipped, like the, the, the what do they call the, the, the people that analyze movies? Critics. The critics, completely opposite from the public. Mm -hmm. Chappelle's special, for example. Yeah. Critics, oh my God, it's terrible. 90% rating yeah, on Fauci documentary. Fauci documentary. Critics, this is the best documentary of all time. <laughs> Most people, this sucks. This is total propaganda. <laughs> yeah. So to me, the, this conspiracy theory, I'm not saying it's true, but I could see where, where people would believe it. You'd be have some form of doubt. There, yeah, because there's a lot of videos criteria. like that where you know the government comes out and says something, and this is the greatest thing ever. Mm, maybe this and is a little bias. Tons of thumbs down and a few you know thumbs up. And I'm like, I wonder if you know that maybe that's well, where it came my from. My prediction is it doesn't last. I don't think they stick with it. I think because consumers like it. Because consumers like yeah. it too much. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of the reason why Instagram now took it. And by the way, yes, yeah, because you have a say. I think Instagram it makes way more sense than YouTube. Like Instagram is not used as a search engine. It's a popularity contest. Yeah. So I think that it's a, it's a cesspool of that bull of vanity. Oh, you think, you're right? you're so, saying that the dislike yeah. is even more important. For, there. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that the 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 hearts. That's what I mean. The or the likes that you yeah. can see. I think people not seeing that. That's probably healthier for our society. And it doesn't have. It doesn't give you as a viewer. Like you go on someone's page, and whether their last picture got ten thousand likes or five likes doesn't change the value of the content for you or or your mind. Not or nearly as much as YouTube. No, YouTube is a search engine. Like you search to learn about something Good for point. the most part, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, most people are, I mean, I know there's some people that are consuming like entertainment stuff, but for the most part, you're you're trying to learn something. And so you use it for that. And the likes and dislikes is has tremendous value on deciding whether I want to listen to it or not. Back to the sort of tin foil stuff here. Um, <laughs> I, I, I read this article, I think it was on, on uh, Yahoo!, uh, that um, basically, so the next thing that we should all be concerned with, according to Bill Gates, and you know, we should have these sort of germ um, type of like reenactment scenarios, right? Germ drills. I forget what they actually call them, but basically, the next one was that we should be concerned with uh, you know terrorists sort of in in airports weaponizing smallpox. Oh, nice. Uh, and so I thought that was uh, you know interesting, concerning. I'm going to pay attention, but also to the. Uh, uh, you know, there the last four months, I guess, uh, you know, the FDA approved a uh, a new drug for uh, smallpox. Oh, that's so good time. That's another sort of interesting yeah. fun fact to, to consider. That's like straight out of the movie 007 we just watched. I know, right? Yeah. Isn't it smallpox that they yeah. they, they weaponize? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my yeah. god! And they you know attach it to like your DNA. We are living in a movie. Dude. I don't I know. Like, I don't. I'm not like super privy on all the like Bill Gates hate and conspiracy stuff, but I am. I do know that that before COVID, they. I mean, not too far before COVID, they talked specifically about a coronavirus breakout and mm -hmm. what it would look like. That's why I think they're getting a lot of like people. So he did a TED talk and everything about it a long time ago. And it was more like just sort of awareness of like, you know, yeah. globally, we need to be able to, you know, just, you know, to play like it's to be the reasonable uh, side of it is like, you know, he had a lot of concern over, you know, there being a, a pandemic, you know, on some virus form that was kind of like uh, the Corona. Oh, so geez. why, why I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit with the Bill Gates thing. Like why, why would he want to put misinformation out there? What, what is the motive that he has? Now you would think it's to be richer but the guy gives away more money than almost anybody else in the, the U.S. The, okay, so, so I don't. I'm not super privy on it, but from what I've read, okay, the the go. the thing <laughs> is that Bill Gates is like this, you know, like what what's the bane of the super intelligent and successful, right? That they know better than everybody. They're there. I'm here to save the world. He's an elitist, and and he's made comments that we need to shrink the population. Yeah. We in order to save future generations, very and eugenics esque Earth, comments have, he's made. We have to like decrease the population, and so then that's kind of the roots of some of the stuff, right? Like, oh, they want people to die. They only want smart people to live. They want to kill these types of people. That's 
some of the stuff that I read, but I don't, okay. I don't know. Okay, so it's because I, I I was trying to get. Normally, it's like the motive is money. Right. That's, that's normally the motive is like to to get enriched from something like right. this. Like I'm sure that the well, politicians that are pushing the vaccine have got stock in, in right. Pfizer and stuff like that. Well, that I makes mean, he, he does have some incentive there, right? Right. Well, yeah, with, that with makes. The but th- yeah, but my point. That's why I was playing like devil's advocate with him because he's he's one of the guys who gives. If he if he wants to be richer, he just hold on to some of his money. Like you don't you don't try and get richer just so you can give away more of your money. After the guy you, gives away I think a ton of money. After you making billions of dollars, it's not about money anymore. It's about winning or power. Yeah. How can I have more influence and more power? That's why they, you know, want to fly to Mars or be the first private person yeah. on the moon or yeah. Like, it's not about money anymore. Now it's like, how do I flex? I'm already a billionaire. I'm going to do this on behalf of everybody else yeah. because I know more than them. Yeah, you know what the problem is with these conspiracy theories? A lot of them keep kind of turning a little bit true. Like, <laughs> yeah. okay, no, this that, is true. It is. Did you know this it's, is real now? People are spending $8,000 a dose right now for teenage blood. Did you know that? This is a real thing now. What? People are asking for Doug? teenage blood. <laughs> Doug, do you know anything about this? Like, like, I know nothing of this. You know nothing about this? <laughs> this is this is real. I'm going to look this up. This is a real thing. Look at this. Uh, people are spending $7,940 a pop for individual shots of teenage blood. There's a company oh. called Ambrosia. How did they come up with that price? <laughs> that's just the cost of the, that's just the average cost of this or whatever. $7,940? Yeah. So that's why I say $8,000 for- <laughs> We're going to sell these teenagers blood. How much <laughs> you want to charge? Let's do- Seven thousand nine hundred forty dollars. Yeah, it, apparently, no one will think that's a suspicious price. Apparently, it's because in mice they show that young yeah. blood injected to older mice, the older mice start to show more signs of youth and energy. I mean, there's so many conspiracy there's been a theories. Few around experiments this. like this with multiple animals where they've shown that you know uh, transfusions with young blood actually like reverse Dude, their. This, I, this like has a bad to be. Movie. This has to be one of the best times to be like a sci-fi writer or something. You know what I'm saying? It's like layups the worst. everywhere. No, like I layups think it's the worst. Just, you think yeah. it's the worst, bro? If you're a conspiracy uh, theorist, you don't want. You didn't want these things to be true. Is my no. Point. I so I think I look. I think conspiracy theorists like having conspiracy theories. Yeah. But then when they start to come true, those are, they're all freaking out right now. I guarantee you the worst years for conspiracy theories have been the last couple of years. Totally. They're in their room like, now, oh, everything like, is coming oh, true. Because now they're thinking all these other crazy ass ideas like have validity to them. And so it's like, it, before it's kind of fun, like it's entertaining, you know, to, to think okay, that so do you, that's what I'm on gonna... the inside and these nobody knows yes. this crazy stuff behind the curtain. But now like- you know, a lot of these things coming true. It's like, oh my god! But th- now, what if this happens? You know, see, so I don't know. If I, I don't know if I believe that. I feel like uh, I think if you write like a, a movie like that, I think there's a, a big part of you that believes it. I mean, I think that's why it comes. I think that's why it's such. It's so well written. Like when a good futuristic movie or conspiracy theory comes out. I don't think those people are like, oh, this will be fun. Let's just think of some random ideas that might have a future. I think how it's much, like, this is much, where we're going. Yeah. How much in movies would you say, uh, like, have you seen or would you think that is actually like stuff that they're just kind of preparing you for in terms of like technology or well, things that they already know, see, but the public doesn't know? See, here's what yeah. I think. I think that there's different la- different levels of conspiracy theorists. There's the ones that really believe it and you know through their actions. Oh, I have a bunker. And I have a getaway thing and we live off the grid. And then there's the majority of conspiracy theorists, which like to speculate, think it's fun, but they don't really think this shit is going to go down. And they're all freaking out right now. Like I belong to a lot of these uh, kind of economics groups on Facebook and they're all, you know, kind of based in Austrian economics and free markets. And they've been talking about the currencies, you know, fiat currencies crashing for a long time. Well, they're all freaking out right now because this shit looks like it's about to happen it really with all this like money it. that they're printing and yeah. And now they're like, oh my God, it's actually looks it's like, like it deliberate. Might. You're yeah. like, what's going on? I know. So uh, it's, it's kind of hilarious. Uh, so it's, it's yeah, really, but kind of not. No, it's not. <laughs> it's kind of it's hilarious so scary. and not yeah. at the same time. No. You remember when I brought up, by the way, this is a little left turn here, but we brought up, I brought up the uh, McDonald's tea. Yeah. So I had multiple people that like worked for McDonald's that messaged me and they're like, oh, you were right. It's not as well like measured as far they dump a three pound bag of sugar into the tea tea mix. Wow. Um, so uh, you know what? However, they come up with their number for the the macros on the website and stuff mm. like that, and like what's really happening in the place. Because I tell you, when I had my first experience of of tasting that thing, it literally ta- it literally tastes like sugar, just sugar, yeah. and then you have a little bit of tea inside. Just got diabetes. Was, yeah. So somebody mm-hmm. confirmed that. Wow. Well, speaking of things that taste good, so my daughter 
right? She's 12 and she just got braces about a month ago, but they're doing some pretty extensive work um, in her mouth. So they're like opening her palate and there's like a bar in the middle of her upper mouth, uh, you know, an upper jaw and bottom one. And poor girl, like she's going through this phase right now of it because it's early where eating is very hard. Her teeth don't even meet. So she can't really chew on anything and it sucks. I'm trying to figure out how to help her. She's in pain or whatever. Mm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start using the Organifi uh, vanilla chalk, the vanilla uh, protein powder and mm -hmm. start making smoothies. I'll let you guys know. She Because she's like anti anything that's a supplement. I think she's yeah. just rebelling against her dad. Now, does she do okay with milk and all that? Or yes. Is she still so like, I've been giving yeah. her milk, scrambled eggs because she can, because eggs are easy. I've been giving her like a, you know, vitamin to take to make sure her nutrients are high. Um, but meat is real hard. She's got to cut it in like tiny little pieces, making soups. But I'm going to start making her some old school like like smoothies and I'm going to sneak in. If she sees me put the protein powder in, she won't have it. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to make it like uh, on the side uh, yeah. and then sneak in some vanilla Organifi. Did you see the Mind Pump memes that he made of you with no. the Organifi? Uh, it, that's that CGI app or whatever. Is that an app, Justin? Is that uh, what that is? Like the Dr. Frankenstein kind of. Uh, yeah. Um, you didn't see the one he did of you? Yeah, it's like you mixing your Organifi up or whatever like that. It, and then the, the rock deep, one. Deep fake kind of. a uh, So good. It Face is so off. good. It's yeah. amazing like where it's at right now. Now on I'm ass I'm assuming your phone or you can just download that. Have you done mess with that app? Is it a phone? It's a phone well, app. Oh wow. Oh, so there was this movie. It was on um, Netflix. It you know the one with The Rock and with oh, Ryan Reynolds. I heard it was red. Gal What's it called? Not Red Card, but Red Something. Uh, yeah, Red Something. Red Scarlet. Red. No, uh, it's like I a, saw it. They, they were watching it. At my it was house good. It's, a, it's uh, Gal Gadot, Ryan Reynolds, and, uh, and, the, and Rock. the Rock. It yeah. broke so records. Good. So yeah, so you saw it in that one scene. So they were able to kind of digitally map his face and then face swap, yeah. you know, on the other side with his oh. uh, I think it's red iPad. Notice. Yeah. So it's like it, it so then it recognized his face and his characteristics and the way he delivered um that that voice. But uh, it's getting to that point now where like technology can kind of pinpoint all these little, you know, minute gestures of your face and be able to like create well, fakes like that you know speaking of which, by the way that was a good movie i liked it yeah it speaking good. of which you know when they switched over the phones to face recognition they were like oh it's so much better it's not do you know how smart you know what my kids do what so if 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 they want to go through my phone if i'm taking a nap or something what they'll just hold the phone up to my face and then they can open my phone it's so much harder with a thumbprint <laughs> just fyi why do kids always find all just, these crazy oh, hacks, yeah. oh no they'll, they'll trick me like they'll have my phone That's and they'll hilarious. be like hey look over here and then i'll and then i won't even know what they did i'll just like why why do you want me to look and then they'll open my phone bro they can do that like apple pay they're just like yeah yeah i want this oh hey dad yeah. say cheese yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> little i never thought of that shit. yeah dude <laughs> That's pretty. It's, well pretty you know pretty. what's weird about that too because leave it to kids yeah yeah, there was, um, uh, uh, so Courtney has it. So her, it's all set up for her thumbprint and everything for the iPad. And like, so they can't make any purchases in app. And so like Everett figured out that like, if he just like moves his, his thumb enough, like his thumbprint's pretty close to hers. Apparently what? he was able to now purchase things <laughs> We're like, dude, so we had to change the whole thing. So he couldn't do that. But, oh my like, God. He was, he was hacking happen. in and yeah, he was getting all these like songs on Spotify and all this stuff. Dude. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> hey, speaking of purchases, by the way, uh, just want to mention one of our sponsors, NCI. Did you see their money back guarantee that he's doing? Yeah. Well, we talked about it and I think that he got it. I think this is why he's bringing it up again right now is because we talked about how crazy it is that he does this whole money back guarantee if he can't, doesn't get you up to $10,000. But I think he's doing like a zero down thing with it now, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, oh, wow. that wasn't like that before. So essentially what you invest, I don't know exactly how it works, but you'll invest a certain amount for this high level of coaching, but you don't pay it or or you get it back if you don't make $10,000 yeah. within a month or something like that of uh, of working with them. Or in other words, in a month, when when your first months. That's a crazy guarantee. Oh, uh, because the way he did it, the way they did it before was you had you had the total, like what it would cost for a year and you paid half of it up front, and then you did not get billed on the other half until you hit made 10K. 10K. And now so, it's zero down. Is, is what that what it is? That's what it says in the notes. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, so he's really confident. I mean, he's had a lot of success with a lot of these coaches and trainers. I, mm -hmm. I tell you what, that's a no-brainer if you ask me. You know, yeah, if, if yeah. somebody says to me, if you don't make this amount of money, 
you'll get your, I mean, you have this kind of a win-win. There's no, no way you could lose. Oh yeah. They're they're passionately working on, you know, making that achievable. And it's like, it's everything's so actionable and they like make you like take action immediately and like put you on the spot. Well, we're slated to go speak, uh, at one of their events. And is it December? Yeah. First first week of December. I think we're Yeah, So we're going to have some of their top coaches and I think it's in Arizona. And um, should be like 170, 200 coaches and trainers. Yeah, that'd be and, fun. Uh, Adam and I are going to go out and, and we're going to speak R- on rally the troops on different yeah topics. Talk trash about you and Doug. Yeah, uh, that's normally what we do. I, I like assumed that. as much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I love doing that more than anything because uh, I connect the most with uh, I think with trainers. I definitely do. I, when I see that, oh, I, I think you meant talking trash about Doug and Joe. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he loves that too. Like, it's, it's a great pastime he's got. You yeah. like, so speaking of trainers is your favorite. I, you know, I like it because, um, I don't know. I feel like, I, cause I know trainers and I know why they do what they do. It's very rare that you find somebody who became a trainer for any other reason besides the fact that they love fitness and love helping people. Yeah, you just love helping people. You know? So it's, it's not a job where you're like, if I'm talking to like a bunch of financial advisors, you know, Hey, raise your hand if you did this cause you love helping people or which, or did you guys do this cause you want to make a lot of money and everybody raise their hand, right? <laughs> trainers and fitness professionals love fitness and love helping people. A majority of them. That's why they get motivated to do it. So you get this pure kind of motivation to do what you're doing and this passion that I think is almost unmatched in most other. It's almost like a vo- if you've ever been a part of a volunteer group, it's very similar. I've been a part of certain volunteer groups and people, when they volunteer for things, the passion is so strong. And that's, I mean, that's why they do it for free. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very similar when you see in the fitness space. And yeah. then if you teach them, through that passion, here's how you can make this your career yeah. and get your clients to succeed and take care of your family. It's like, it's incre- It's a great um, experience. It really is. Hey, real quick, I want to talk to you about one of the companies that we're invested in and one of our sponsors. Same company. It's called Serenity Kids. Now they make baby food and kids snacks that are healthy. In fact, this is the healthiest company on in that market. I mean, we're talking about grass-fed and grass-finished beef bone broth, grain-free snacks, beets and spinach and sweet potato, like the best ingredients, no preservatives. It's the best stuff. This is the only processed baby food at all that I give my baby son. It's that good. And again, we invested in the company. That's how much we believe in them. So if you have kids and you want them to grow up healthy, we suggest you check out Serenity Kids. So head over to myserenitykids.com and then use the code M P two zero MP twenty for a discount. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is from Flores F R. I'd like to focus on my hamstrings, and I need recommendations for home gym workouts. You know, this is one of the body parts that people will often say is hard to do at home, and I think that's because hmm. when we think of hamstring exercises, we think of hamstring curls, yeah. hamstring curl machines. Now, it is true that if you have a home gym, you probably don't have a hamstring curl machine. But here's the good news. Of all the hamstring exercises you could do, hamstring curl machines are like down, way down the list in terms of effectiveness of building strength, functional uh, ability, size to your hamstrings. The best hamstring exercises are the ones that tend to have you hip hinge. Mm-hmm. Stiff-legged deadlifts, Romanian Romanians. deadlifts, mm-hmm. single-leg deadlifts. like That'll build more muscle and strength in your hamstrings than leg curls. Now, if you love leg curls and you want to work specifically on the leg bicep, which is a part of the leg, the hamstring that does that and flexes the knee, I like to do hips elevated leg curls on a physio ball. I'll do them at the those end of a brutal. hamstring you know, workout. And they're really, they're really good. Those are those are brutal. What's the other, uh, what's the name of the one where you like hook your heels underneath? Like, oh, that's gnarly. What's that, that called? Nordic curl? Is that Nordic curl? Is yeah, that what it's called? I think so. Yeah, I think it's called a Nordic curl. I mean, you could do that. There's ways if you want to, to do that specific movement that you can just find a way to do it at home. Yeah. But RDLs and good mornings. I mean, you, you do RDLs and good mornings for your hamstrings and I guess throw some stability ball leg curls in there. And I think, I think it's just because of all the muscles, it's probably the one that I think, as far as your main muscles that everybody trains, uh, has the least amount of machines for. Yeah. Right? If They're you all the, leg curl. All variations of well, leg curl. I always thought that, that lats were a lot more difficult to address for at-home workouts. Uh, being as though, like, you really have to have something, like, attached to get any kind of pull-up situation or, like, some cables or something like that versus you can't use gravity just, yeah so I, I always found that a little more difficult but yeah i could 
I mean, you're right. There are like people kind of recognize hamstrings as being attached to those very specific types of machines in the gym. Yeah. So a leg curl machine, you know, we don't have that, but you can get a pretty nice, um, you know, uh, exercise you out know, of those that you mentioned. You know, I, I actually started to notice uh, more development in my hamstrings just from squatting deeper too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was like one of those, both the, the calf and hamstring I got as a, a secondary benefit that I was not anticipating from just trying to, like when I was working on my squat, I was like, oh, I'm going to do this so I could develop my calves more, my hamstrings. But I noticed they developed more just from doing that. I thought that was- Especially really, really deep, right? Yeah. The yeah. stabilization that's involved. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people, when they think of hamstrings, the average person thinks of, you know, flexing the knee, right? Bending the knee. Not realizing that the hamstrings play a huge role in hip hinging. Mm -hmm. And you're going to get, there, it's true that one part of the bicep, excuse me, of the hamstring known as the leg bicep, is involved in the flexing of the knee. But it's also involved in stabilizing when you're hip hinging. And then the big part of the hamstring is the hip, it hip hinges you. So, I mean, if you had to pick one exercise for really well-developed hamstrings, it wouldn't be leg curls. It no. would be no. a Romanian deadlift. Yeah, or yeah. like a single leg deadlift. Way more functional. Way more functional. But yeah. again, if, if you want to work that leg curl motion, I dare you. Try it. I don't, even well, if you go to a gym, I challenge you. This is what you do. Do two hip hinging type hamstring exercises like Romanian deadlifts and maybe like a single leg deadlift and then finish off with your hips elevated physio ball leg curls. And, and, and now here's, this is true now. Most people will feel the hamstrings more with a hips elevated physio ball leg curl than they will on a leg curl yeah. machine because it encourages you to push your hips up and really work those, uh, those hamstrings. Whereas hamstring curl machines, sometimes people bring up their hip flexors to do the, the now, the hamstring curl. how do you guys feel about this new product? And I've seen a lot of people showing me that uh, is basically looks like a ski boot. Oh, monkey feet. Yeah. What? And yeah, it, yeah. It, what? it attaches a dumbbell to basically the heel of your foot. It's just a weighted do, shoe. Oh, By the way, it's pretty silly. Most of this equipment, it's recycles every 10 years. That's like one of the earliest. <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. One of the earliest pieces of a gym equipment or, you know, at home fit fitness equipment were like weights that you would attach to your wrists and your ankles. Uh -huh. It's just a version of that. Well, what, what, what they're showing in the in the commercials is like someone standing, they have this dumbbell attached to their do shoe. Like donkey kicks? N and no, yeah, or they're doing like a single leg curl, you know, mm -hmm. to do single it. Single leg curl. Which, basically. I mean, that's okay, but I'm telling you, it's not working the hamstrings well, not nearly only that, as well. But it's like, I mean, I've got uh, most of my female clients deadlifting 200 plus pounds. Yeah. So good luck yeah. putting a 200 pound dumbbell <laughs> on your legs to try to get that same stimulation. I think you're going to get that. No. So I think if you're, if you get really good at single leg deadlifts, RDLs and good mornings, you're going to have yeah, well you're developed. Covered. Yeah. You're covered. Next question is from Sar Dibley. How can I back squat more weight? I have good depth, but struggle lifting heavy. Okay. So context really matters, right? Depends on the person, how they're squatting, what the weak area is. That'll change my advice. So I'm, I don't know who this person is. I've never seen him squat. Don't know what the workout looks like. So I'm going to give general advice that I think is effective for pretty much any strength goal. Okay. And that's this. Practice the particular exercise frequently. Now I say practice specifically because I don't mean go out and hammer yourself with squats five days a week. You can do that once a week, but the other days go out and practice your squat. Like if you increase the frequency of how much you practice an exercise, you will get stronger. I don't care if it's bench press, pull-ups, uh, squats. If I squat hard one day a week and then the rest of the week I'm doing, you know, five sets and practicing my form, my technique, and I go lower sometimes, sometimes I go a little heavier, lower reps, higher reps. That practice in, in my experience leads to some of the most rapid strength gains for most people in pretty much any exercise. Yeah, I'm going to kind of uh, talk about something very specific. And this does depend on whether or not you have a squat rack and you have safety bars that you can use for this. But I really like this in terms of trying to generate more force. And really, if you can learn how to generate more force, you're going to be able to use that as a, as a way to propel your body and have more strength in your movement. So uh, isometrics are a big part of this, oh, and I, yeah. I talk about this a lot. I mean, and so you can get into pause squats where you're sitting in that squat, and usually the bottom is where the weakness is and driving out of the hole, right? 
So just to be able to sit in that and squeeze and really connect to that and, and try and recruit more in that position is one method, but then also setting the um, safety bars. So basically they're at the top and you're pushing up into the safety bar. So if I'm at, if I'm sitting in my squat and then I'm pushing up and meeting resistance and I'm squeezing as far as I possibly can and not going anywhere, you're going to find that that has a lot of generating force ability. Dude, um, along those lines, I've seen someone do this and I think it's absolutely brilliant. So I've done that before where you set the safeties, you get the bar underneath it and you push up in the safeties. The problem is if you get strong, you have to put weights on the cage because you'll actually tip the cage over. Oh, yeah. So it's not bolted in. I've seen someone do this, what I'm about to say, and I think it's absolutely brilliant. So all they, and this is such brilliant home gym, advanced training, you know, setup. He put, he literally put bolts into the cement. So he had two bolts into the cement with like loops on them. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I don't know what that's called. It's a bolt with a, with a circle loop. Mm -hmm. And then he puts chains around the bar. and It's an eye bolt. Yeah. And attaches various lengths of the chain to the bolt. So he gets mm-hmm. under the bar, the bar is bolted and chained to these bolts and cement, and then he gets underneath. So you can and only can, go up so far. You can only yeah. go up so far. That's, and he squats against that, and it's going to hold because yeah. it's bolted to the concrete. Mm. And he could change the the how deep or how high he wants to go by the links of the chain. Yeah. I thought that was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, it's one of the smart. smartest ways to do what you said, which is that, you know, where you're doing an isometric drive, mm-hmm. not moving anywhere. You know what I like about that also is it doesn't damage muscle. No, you like, can back out easy. You could do it frequently. Mm-hmm. You could practice something like that three days a week in, in different varying you know depths or whatever, and you'll see some serious strength gains. Well, since we're just we're having fun speculating because we definitely don't have enough information for this this question. Uh, yeah. yeah, let's be honest. Like, there's well, I don't so, know what they're doing. Right? I know we're all like we're all, which is cool because we're, we're all just I'll, doling advice. Right, you know, I'll, I'll go a different direction, right? Because yeah. there's there are so many different ways, but uh, I, I'll try try and think of things that I saw that were real common. So when I have somebody who has like a really good deep squat. Uh, and it's, so it's not like a range of motion thing, but they just cannot load the bar. And it's because there's a breakdown somewhere or they have like a really weak core and they can't hold themselves really tight. So if you, and I like where Justin's going with the whole isometric thing, being able to stay contract, contracted and tight through the movement, that has, a. I mean, I know for me, if, uh, if I like don't tighten and brace my core, I, I'm like night and day difference on how much I move. I can move like the performance 50 league. to hundred more pounds when I'm like, I brace really and I'm rigid yeah. and I'm tight to the movement because the slightest bit of moving left or right or front to back or your core kind of folding in. Cause you it's don't want not, any looseness. Yeah. You lose, you lose that energy on, on a big movement, like a back squat. So making sure that you have a, a really tight core and that you're rigid is, is a good idea. Training like the isometrics is going to help uh, do something like that. So practice with something like that. Although this could be, you know, a million other things. Mm-hmm. Next question is from Fit Trucker Lady. How would kettlebell swings be put into a program? Is it like cardio, strength, or conditioning? Uh, all it can be all of them. Yeah, all of the above. Yeah, if you're doing kettlebell swings for a long time with light weight, well, now you're doing more conditioning cardio. Mm-hmm. If you do it heavy and explosively, you're more strength uh, and power. Um, I like to do, because it's a relatively ballistic movement, like a kettlebell swing is not like most resistance training movements where you're like controlling the descent. Like In fact, if you've ever seen a bodybuilder try to do a kettlebell swing, they, they do it wrong because everything they're used to doing is controlled. So they do this weird like forward shoulder raise with the kettlebell. It's definitely different. I like to put it personally at the beginning of the workout. I'd like to warm up, get everything good and loose, start my workout with that, and then move to my traditional resistance training exercises. I don't necessarily like to do it at the end because I'm already fatigued at the end. And personally, I do it more for explosive power, mm-hmm. which if I'm at the end, I'm already fatigued. I don't feel like I'm going to get much of that you know, at the end of the workout. That's my favorite usage of it. And I think um, hard style is one that uh, resonates with me more because it's very much more of that controlled uh, hip power, hip drive. And, and that's really what uh, a lot of the benefit that I've uh, acquired from that uh, in terms of like athleticism, explosive movement, um, you're going to generate that all from that hip hinging, you know, that driving, you know, hip power. So uh, kettlebells are like one of the best tools for that. So I, I like to program it in where I do heavy kettlebell swings for less reps. Uh, and I'm just very much controlled 
and uh, it, it's about it's about just like getting the, the weight to pendulum where you have maximal control and then you're driving it with all your force at once when you need to. So it's a timing thing mm-hmm. and it's also a fast, loose approach. So I've had the most uh, uh, benefit with clients that are they're trying to prime the butt before squats. So squatting or deadlifting. So if I'm about to do a hip hinge movement, uh, priming beforehand, and that looks like a five to 10 rep heavier, and you're just trying to get them to be able to explode those hips forward. Um, and I, I find it is a good way to help somebody who has a hard time feeling like squats or deads in their glutes. Uh, that's a great exercise. Although I don't, I didn't program it a lot. Um, I, those are the clients that I used it, but there, I, there, you could do any of the ones that she's suggesting. I mean, none of them are wrong. Mm-hmm. I just think it's where you, what you, what you're trying to accomplish matters the most. Of course. Right. So if you're trying to burn a bunch of calories and you want to get a good sweat on, uh, then let's grab a light one and let's do it for five or 10 minutes. And there's nothing wrong with, with doing that. If that's what you want to do. Uh, if you want to really work on your explosiveness from a, coming out of the hole of a squat, then I'm going to pick a much heavier weight and I'm only going to do it probably five to 10 times on each side, something like that. So uh, that's how I would use it when I'd use it for clients. Yeah. When I used to program them, uh, if I did a full body workout, I would start the full body workout with kettlebell swings after I was primed and warmed up. If I did any kind of a split and really the only kinds of split that I've ever really done in the more recent you know time has been more of an upper lower split. If I'm going to deadlift, I like to do it before I deadlift. Otherwise, it's usually on a lower body day, before squats uh, or before lunges. Not really before back day, unless, again, I'm deadlifting. But if I'm doing just rows and pull-ups and stuff like that, um, then I'll leave it for the leg day. Next question is from Stuart75002. I recently read an article saying that bulking is a young man's game. Is there any age where you would recommend, not recommend, eating in a caloric surplus? Okay, so this I don't read this article, but it's probably referring to the type of bulking that uh, is the wrong way to bulk, right? The, yeah. the, the way that you bulked when you were younger, when you didn't track. Yeah. Just high calories, like all means necessary. Yeah, let's see how much weight I can gain and yeah. let's see how much I can eat. So that, yeah, I agree. You get away with that when you're young because when you're older and you eat in a ridiculous surplus with a bunch of garbage food, you're going to damage your health probably a lot more. But in terms of bulking the right way, right, which is eating in a surplus to gain muscle and strength or to reverse diet to get the metabolism to boost, that works for anybody. I don't care what age you are. I don't care how old you are. But the surplus can't be so big where you're just gaining excessive body fat. And again, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how old you are. You don't want to eat in such a surplus to where, yeah, I gained three pounds of lean body mass, but I also gained you know, 10 pounds of body fat. Well, okay, your, your surplus is a little too much and you're not training properly. I like to keep, I like to make sure that the, the weight that my clients would gain through a bulk was almost all muscle. Now, inevitably, depending on the person, they would gain some body fat, but it, it, it couldn't make up more than 10 or 15% of the total weight that they gain. It's like, if, if you gain 10 pounds and, you know, five of it's body fat, like your, your, your surplus is a little too high. I mean, I'd like to read this article, but I'm willing to, I mean, I, I can get behind it because I'm willing to bet their angle they're taking is just bulking looks different today at 40 than what it did at 25 for me. Sure. And a lot of that has to do with just my movement. You know, I'm a dad now. I have a job where I talk on a mic all day long. I sit in a car for two hours a day. Yep. Like, like I just don't burn nowhere near the calories. So bulking for me is literally adding a protein shake on top of what my maintenance is or very little do I have to add yep. to put myself in a calorie surplus. And so it looks, whereas when I was a kid and I know you both can relate to this feeling of like, I can't eat enough. I mean, force feeding peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and slamming these whole milk shakes because I'm playing basketball. I'm training eight to 10 clients a day. I'm running around with my friends. Like I'm on the weekends, I'm doing active sports stuff. Like I just was burning so many calories that, and I think that I I was probably the common young teenage boy who is active and into sports and stuff like that. You just burn a ton of calories. And so I think that's where probably this is coming from. And then as you get into your thirties and forties and beyond, there's very few men at that age are probably moving as much as what you were when you were 20 years old. Yeah. And also when you're younger, your training program, at least mine wasn't as smart 
I didn't understand. I overtrained often. I went to failure on my lifts too much, did too much mm -hmm. with my workouts. So my workouts weren't sending the best signal. So it was all about how many calories I could get in to see the scale move. And I also didn't care if it was body fat or muscle because I grew up skinny. Mm -hmm. For me, like a pound on the scale was a pound on the scale and I didn't care. So I, you know, my decisions were like, oh my God, I'm so stuffed after lunch. How can I force more calories in? Oh, I'll eat a bag of Skittles or I'll drink some Coke, right? Um, or I'm going to go to the fast food place and supersize everything and then I'll get those extra calories. That kind of bulking isn't good for anyone. Yeah. Now, the reason why it may be a young man's game is you get away with it more when you're younger. That was the point that I was trying to make. Yeah. But proper bulking is proper bulking. Whether you're young or old, It's you have to send the right signal. The body has to want to build muscle. And then you give it enough calories to do that and not too many over because then you just gain body fat. Well, and I think too, it's just like generally as you get older, like the, the game really is like, I don't want to add any more weight, you know, like, and I want to, it, you've, you've done a really good job of figuring out uh, how to consume calories and uh, not move quite as much. And so like your lifestyle is completely different than it was, you know, maybe when you're more dialed in and you're younger and like, you, yeah, the, the margin of error was uh, you know, not quite as, as slim, which is now it's like every little thing you have to like be a little bit more dialed in. So I think just taking in all those factors, like you mentioned in terms of our, uh, what that looks like now, activity level wise, uh, your, your consistency, uh, how hard you're really getting after it in the gym, all these types of things are going to, you know, play a factor in terms of how far you're going to push that. Yeah. Book. And one thing you said is very true when I was younger, and I think as people get older, they tend to become a little bit more obviously mature, but less insecure. And I didn't care. I just wanted to get bigger. Yeah. Now, even if I had the ability to just gain like as much muscle as I wanted, I wouldn't want to go to the point where I was uncomfortable. Whereas when I was younger, I didn't care. I'd be as uncomfortable as hell. Couldn't breathe. Didn't fit in me. You know, I, that was great. I was, you know, right. because it totally fed to my insecurity. Now I'd be unhappy. Yeah. I don't want to feel like I can't move and I'm uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, so it's just one of those things. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our guides. So we have guides that can help you build muscle or burn body fat or just improve your health and much more. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at mindpumpjustin. I'm at mindpumpsal. And Adam is at mindpumpadam. 